Hey guys, it's Greg. Today I'm going to show you how to do image classification in TensorFlow properly. That means no cutting corners. We're going to use the best model, try to get the best results. We'll use image augmentation to manipulate and essentially make our data set even bigger than it already is. We're going to use a custom data set. So if you have taken a bunch of pictures on your phone and you want to use that as a data set, I'll show you how to do that and do it in the most efficient way. So let's get started. It is currently October 2022, and one of the best models that you could use is EfficientNet V2L. So we're going to use that. From tensorflow.kiras.applications, we'll import that model, EfficientNet V2L, that was for large, and we'll start with model is in instantiation, EfficientNet V2L, where the weights are coming from ImageNet. So we'll do transfer learning trained on ImageNet. Include top equals false because we don't want their thousand dimensional softmax. We want to train our own. And in this problem, we are going to be doing binary classification for a sigmoid. But I'll tell you about the differences if you do want to do multi class classification and you would use a softmax of your own instead. And our input shape, it's going to be the same 224 by 224 by 3 that it'll be used to. But you can use your own input shape if you did want to use something else. And I'll just do a model.summary to show you all the different layers. The first layer, it takes our input 224 by 224 by 3. Its second layer is rescaling, which is good. It handles pre-processing for you or your standardization, normalization, whatever you want to call it. It handles that for you. So as long as you're passing it standard images, then it will be okay with that. I'm going to skip through all this stuff. It ends in a 7 by 7 by 1280 rectangular prism. We are going to add one convolution to that, and then we will do a global average pooling after that. Sorry, ignore the look of this. We have to do for layer in model dot layers and set layer dot trainable equal to false, which says go through each layer in the model in this continent and freeze all of the weights in those layers, which says don't let it be trainable, just treat that model as a fixed function that's going to output a 7 by 7 by 1280 based off the image. It's going to be used for transfer learning. And if you wanted, you could maybe set this layers to be like maybe up until negative 10. So you could set most of the layers to be not trainable and then allow a little bit of flexibility in the end. But we're just going to use all of it as not trainable. So we will just add on to this model. So we'll do from tensorflow.kiras.models import sequential. We'll do some sequential stuff after this model. And we'll do from tensorflow.curas.layers. I like to import all of them just so we have everything. And then I'll say that my model is the sequential where we're taking in the model as the first layer. It's going to do that, take an image and convert it to that 7 by 7 by 1280 rectangular prism. We're going to add our own convolution, conv2d, say 1024 filters. We'll make it a 3 by 3 and a stride of 1. And activation is going to be a Revo activation. After that, we'll do a global average pooling 2D. And I'm just going to show you what that is as a model. It's not done yet, but I'll show you the summary so far. And you can see it takes your image, the efficient net stuff, turns it into the 7 by 7 by 1280. We are going to do our own convolution down to 5 by 5 by 1024. And then we do a global average pooling, which takes it down to 1024. You can basically think this layer as 1024 5 by 5 squares. If you take one of those 5 by 5 squares and stretch it out into a vector, you would have 25 values. If you calculate the average of those values, you'd be left with just one value. And so this is what the global average pooling does it takes the average of each of those squares so you're just left with 1024 averages after we've done that global average pooling we are going to add a little bit of dense stuff so a dense of say 1024 with an activation equal to relu these numbers are fairly flexible as long as you do some fairly big value it's probably going to work pretty well there's different things that you could try for sure we'll do a relu there and then maybe a dropout, so dropout equal to, say, 0.2, which means there's a 20% probability that any of these 1024s just turn to zero. That'll help for overfitting. We'll do that, say, again, maybe another 1024 with another activation equal to the ReLU function. And then we will do another dropout, so maybe a dropout 
of say 0.2 as well. We could play around with any of those numbers and then we'll do a dents of one with an activation equal to a sigmoid because the data set that we will be using in this example is going to be for cats versus dogs. It's a really big data set, but it is only two different classes. If you were doing a classification problem with multiple classes, maybe for your problem, you were trying to decide between giraffes, rhinos, and leopards, then you would have a three dimensional dense here and an activation equal to softmax. Okay, we're just going to run that model and make sure that it works. There you go. Turns it into a seven by seven by 1280. We do our own convolution. We do a global average pooling. We do some dense stuff and then eventually get it into just one. It's sigmoid because we're doing the probability that it is the positive class. Whatever the positive class is denoted by, it would be either cat or dog and we'll see in a bit. Okay, now we're going to get our data set and I'm going to use Kaggle to do that. Now for this, I assume that you've created a Kaggle token. If you haven't done it, don't worry, it's actually really easy. Just make a Kaggle account and then go into the settings in your account and you can do generate API token. That should generate a Kaggle.json file and you just have to upload that Kaggle.json file into your environment. For me on Colab here, I'll just upload it now. And there you go. I didn't show you, but Kaggle.json is there. Make sure that you have it as well. And I would just copy whatever this code is. I don't really want to write it out. It's some Linux stuff to make sure that you get the data set from Kaggle and then you unzip the folder. Okay, and you should see test one and train. I don't know why it's called one on test. It's really just train and test. Those zip files, they actually need to be unzipped as well. And so we need to go through and do unzip train.zip as well as unzip test1.zip. We'll run that and it'll unzip those folders. And that's where all of your images actually are. So if you're in train, it'll take a while to load, but basically it starts with cat and then a number if they're a cat, and it starts with dog and then a number if they're a dog. And for test, they're all just numbers because the point is that you don't know what the labels are for test. This is from a Kaggle competition. Now, because you can't actually submit to the Kaggle competition, I did try. We don't have to worry about test. There's really nothing we can do with it. So we're just gonna be using train. Okay, now we do have to move our data set into the format that you want. And this is really important, whether you're doing binary classification, just two classes like we are, or multi-class classification, three, four, a hundred classes the folder structure is going to look exactly the same. Okay, we're gonna make a few different folders to store our images. So we'll do import OS to move files and folders around. And we will try to do os.makeDIRS with the images. So this says, hey, try to make this folder called images, except that will fail if it already exists. So we'll do accept file exists error, and then just pass. So this says, hey, try to make this folder called images. If it already exists, then don't worry about it. Do nothing and move on. We will do something very, very similar two more times. So here, except this is going to be nested within images. So for that, we do os.path.join. So we nest within images. We are going to make this folder called cats. And that's where all of the cat images are going to go. We're going to do this one more time. Sorry, there has to be a and a bracket there. We're going to do this one more time and here we will do it for instead of images cats images dogs and you would do this for every different class that you have if you have a lot of them then you would probably want to automate this process instead of literally writing cats and dogs you'd want to do this in a loop so that it got the right variable but this will work because we only have two classes okay and if we run that we should see that if we refresh we'll see this images folder and it's an empty folder with cats and dogs within that now we actually have to put all of our images, which are stored in train, we're actually not using test. We're gonna put all of those images that are in train. The cat ones are gonna to go to images slash cats and the dog ones are gonna to go to images slash dogs. Now for this, we're gonna switch over to something similar to OS, but it's gonna be shutil. You could use OS, it's just what I decided on. And we're gonna say for file name in the os.lister. So that says, hey, get all the stuff that's in train, all the stuff that's in the train folder, we are going to, well, I'll just print file name to show you what it is. So we're on the same page here. It has a bunch of cat and dog images where they start with either cat or dog, and then they have dot and then a number and then dot JPG, because that's the image. So we're gonna go through each of these files and we have to move it in the right spot. We're gonna get full path equal to the os.path.join with train 
and file name. Okay, so now we're just getting the full path here. If we print full path, there you go. We have the full path to each of those images. That's useful just because we need to actually grab each of them. You need the full path for that. Then we'll do if the file name dot split on dot. Okay, we're splitting on dot. That should actually be twice because there's cat dot number dot JPEG. So if you do that dot split and then sub zero, that means, hey, when you split it on dot, it's going to be a list of three things. It'll have cat, then 8964, then JPG for this one. And actually, I will just print that for you. So again, we're on the same page here. Print file name dot split sub zero. We'll run that quickly and then stop it. There you go. It's either cat or dog, depending on what the image is. So we're saying, hey, if this file name dot split sub zero is equal equal to cat, so if the image is a cat, we will do an shutil.copy from the full path. So that's the thing we want to copy. And we want to put it to os.path.join the images, cats, and file name spot. Then if we want to do if it was a dog, then we can just do else. Again, for you, if there's multiple classes, you might want to automate this and go through and find the right folder to put it in. But for us, if it's not a cat, then it is a dog. So we'll just do it like this. Else, shutil.copy. I'm just going to copy this over because it will be exactly the same thing. If it's a dog, you want to move it to the dogs folder. We're going to run that, and that probably will take a little bit of time. Actually, it won't take any time because I have a syntax error. I always do that. There's an extra bracket on those two. I'll run that again. Okay, and that did finish. So what that did, since we copied, they still will be in train. There is all the cat pictures in this cats folder and all of the dog pictures in this dog folder. There you go, the dog one's loaded. Here's all the dog images. Now, I do want to show you that this works even if images are of a different resolution. And so what I already did before is I downloaded a cat image that I want to put in the cats folder. So I'm just going to magically upload that now. So I uploaded this cat image, cat.arandomcat I added and it's high resolution but it looks like this it's actually way too zoomed in because it is really high res but here's a cat you can kind of tell it's a cat oh look at that cute little nose okay so what i did is i'm just adding another cat here to show you you can use different resolution i can drag it over here into the cats folder now depending on how that's done you may actually need to do some little command here i'm not going to talk about it but if you find that you have an error about ipython notebook checkpoints, then consider running this code or doing a slight modification to it. I'm just going to comment it out. But basically, it makes some IPython notebooks file sometimes and you want to get rid of that because it'll mess up your generator. Okay, but I think it was fine for me. So I don't believe I have to run that. We'll see if I get any errors. Okay, now to the TensorFlow stuff. So we are going to import TensorFlow as TF and we'll get a batch size equal to whatever your computer does best. For Colab here, if you're running with me, then I think that on the GPU, a batch size of four works pretty well. You could probably do bigger. You could definitely do smaller. Uh, and you do need a seed. So make sure that you do a seed. It doesn't really matter what it is, but seed equals one is fine. You do need a seed the way that we're doing this because TensorFlow needs to know not to overlap some images in the training set and put those in the validation set as well. Now we're going to do train data set is equal to tf.kiras.utils.image data set from directory so it's from a directory and so we're doing that and it is going to be the images folder okay so we're passing just the images folder because it says hey give me the folder where i can see folders of all the different classes in this images folder it'll see a cats folder and a dogs folder and it'll automatically understand that there's two different classes there's cats and dogs we need to specify that the color mode of these images is rgb and the batch size is equal to whatever we want it to be. That's going to be our hyperparameter there. Our image size without the channels value, it's just the height and the width. It's going to be 224 by 224. And what's cool about this 224 by 224 is even though I passed in an image here that has a really different resolution, I passed a really, really big unsquare resolution, it still will automatically reshape and deal with it appropriately. Now we want to specify that shuffle is equal to true, which says on every epoch, we do want to shuffle around this data set. And then we'll say that validation split is equal to 0.2, which says, hey, this training set, it's going to make up with the one minus 0.2 equal to 0.8. 
the training set will be equal to 80% of the data. And this subset, this particular subset that we're grabbing is going to be the training set. And the seed has to have a seed. And so we'll set seed equal to seed, which in this case is just one. Now we need to do the same thing except for the val data set. I am just gonna copy in here and save the changes. So it's still in the images folder. The color mode is still RGB. The batch size should actually be batch size. That's an error in my notes. Batch size, image size 224, 224. Shuffle is false. We have no need to shuffle around the val data set because we're just reporting metrics on it. Validation split still has to be that same value 0.2 and subset, this subset is the validation and seed has to be the same seed as above. Okay, so that's actually all you need to do for setting up your data sets in this format. It's really, really easy. It finds 25,001 belonging to two classes. It should be 25,000, except I added a random cat image into the cats folder. Okay, we're going to look at how TensorFlow would loop through this. So we're going to get an iterator equal to an iter of the train data set. If you haven't seen iterators, they are pretty cool. We'll do next on the iterator. And then just take my word for this and don't really worry about it. Sub zero, sub zero, dot numpy, dot shape. If we call that, it's gonna be 224 by 224 by three. That sure looks like an image. And if you keep running this, I'm just doing control enter or on Mac, I think it's command enter. Keep running this cell. It's gonna be 224 by 224 by three every time, but they are different images. Let's actually visualize that a little better. So for that, we will use matplotlib, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt and import numpy as np. We'll do a plt.imshow with the next of the iterator. So grab the next thing in the data set. That thing, actually what we want is not just the iterator next, we want sub zero, sub zero, dot numpy, dot as type on numpy dot int 32. Make sure that's an integer, otherwise matplotlib will not show it properly. And here you go. Don't really worry about the specifics there. We keep jumping over this and we can see different images. You can see sometimes we see cats, sometimes we see dogs. Sometimes we see weird images of dogs and it's kind of cool that we'll get the accuracy that we will because these images are kind of weird and it's shuffled because we iterated over the training data set, which is shuffled. Now we're going to visualize and implement some data augmentation, which means, hey, maybe we might as well make this do a horizontal flip, like put this dog over here and make it look to the right over here. It's basically just making the data set even bigger by doing some simple tricks and you can implement it really efficiently in TensorFlow. So down here, we are going to do from tensorflow.image. We'll import a few different things. There's certainly a lot more that you could do. We're just gonna do a couple cool ones. We'll do a flip left, right. It's kind of funny how it's called that, but that literally what it is. It is a flip left, right of the image. We will do and adjust the brightness and adjust the contrast. And in my notes, I also have adjust gamma, although I'm not gonna use that. So we're going to do this function, define augment, which takes an image and a label. It's just for convenience sake to get the label and return it as well. And we're gonna do image is equal to a flip left right of the image which says if you check the documentation on this library and these functions, you'll see this one is basically a 50% chance that it flips the image. So we can just call that every time. Image is equal to adjust the brightness with an image, we'll say delta equal to 0.1. And that's all I'm going to do for now, although I'll make this a little more complicated in a moment. We'll return image and the label. And then what we have to do is set the pipeline for this training data set. We'll set training data set equal to training data set dot map. We'll map the augment function, which says call the augment function every time you load an image or every time you load a batch of images, make sure that you use this function. And then for efficiency, you have to do num parallel calls equal to tf dot data dot auto tune. We'll see that a couple times. And if we look at another iterator, iterator over the train data set, sorry, I should make that a variable iterator is equal to an iter of the train data set. We'll grab the exact same thing as above. So that same matplotlib graphing function, 
except now it's doing it on next on this new iter iterator here. Here we have that this image is these puppies, except we'll go around and it turns out that they are actually flipping them around. This cat might have been looking the other way before, and this dog might have been looking the other way before. So let's really make sure that we can see a difference here and just do something really, really crazy to show you that this is definitely working. If you set the brightness to something like maybe 100, we'll do that and then run this thing again. You'll see, yeah, the brightness is going crazy now. Like it's saying clipping the data because it's basically an error. It's kind of a warning, but this is really just really messed up these images. They're way too bright. And so this is just confirming that these things are working. We'll set it back to its value of 0.1. And let's just do a little bit more of augmentation. I'm just going to copy this in. It's on adjusting the contrast. So we will also do image is adjust contrast. Image contrast factor happens to be 1.75 for us. We'll still return the image in the label and we will run this again. Now what's kind of tricky is that this train data set, actually, if you don't reload the train data set, this is basically just over and over again telling the pipeline, hey, you should map the augment function. And then if you run it again, it's saying it'll map the augment function again and again and again. So if you are testing different functions here, make sure you don't just keep running this because if we go to check this, here you go, it's still gonna be really, really bright because it still is mapping the brightness. And so this is just as messed up as it was before. So if we go to, you have to refresh it here, just run this piece again where it loads and iterates over the train data set. And it doesn't take too long, luckily. Grab our iterators. Here is the original images untouched, and they look fine. Here we call the augment function, and it's gonna do a little bit of manipulation. Here you go, it's, you can kind of see that these pieces are darker than they used to be. And this, you can see obviously this was flipped because the numbers are backwards. Now because of the way we set this up, we really don't have to worry about much of the pipeline details here. I am going to do train dataset is equal to train dataset dot prefetch. This is just for optimization, prefetch and that tf.data.autotune thing to make sure that that's optimized. And then we should see train data set here. It really doesn't show you that much, but that's what it looks like. And if we were to do pretty much the same thing for the val data set, you don't want to augment it. There's really no point of that. And so we will do val data set is equal to val data set dot prefetch on tf dot data dot auto tune. And we get output val data set. Now what we're going to do is get some metrics. And it's going to be a little bit different depending on whether you're doing multi-class classification or binary classification. We are doing binary classification. And I'll talk about some of the details if you wanted to look at multi-class. So we'll do from tensorflow.kiras.metrics. We're just going to grab all of them. We're only using a few. And we're going to set our metrics equal to We'll look at just accuracy. You can use that as a string. We'll get recall and precision. Actually, people usually say pre precision and recall. So we'll do it in that order. Precision and recall, recall with brackets and AUC. And that is all the metrics we're gonna use for this problem. If you were doing multi-class classification, look up the documentation on these metrics to make sure that you're using stuff that makes sense with multiple classes. Some of these work well, some of these might have a little bit of errors. Most of this stuff still moves over to multi-class classification. Just make sure you check the documentation. Now we're gonna get our optimizer and our loss function from tensorflow.kiras.optimizers. We'll import just Adam is what I always use from tensorflow.kiras.losses import binary cross entropy. If you were doing multi-class classification, you would want to do categorical cross entropy instead of binary cross entropy. And we'll compile our model with my model.compile with loss is binary cross entropy bracket bracket and optimizer is equal to Adam with say a learning rate equal to We'll do 0.001. Make sure if you're having difficulties with your own problem, play around with that value. That could be very important. And metrics is just our list of metrics, and we'll run that. Okay, now we're going to do an early stopping, which if you haven't done before, is really, really, really useful. From tensorflow.curious.callbacks, we'll import early stopping. And we'll set an early stopping callback ES equal to early stopping and patience equal to some value of interest. I'm going to use three here and monitor probably the val loss makes the most sense. 
So what this says here is stop training if you hit a minimum battle loss and then you can't beat that for three consecutive epochs. It's a really good way to not train too much and to avoid overfitting. Now we're just gonna fit the model, my model.fit on the train data set with epochs equal to something it's not gonna hit like a thousand because the early stopping will take care of that. Validation data is just equal to the val data set and callbacks equal to the list of yes. That's the only callback we're gonna use. And just let that run now to make sure that it is going to run and that things look okay. But right now we are on a CPU. Make sure that you're using a GPU when you actually train this. Okay, that took about a minute for me to even get going, but it looks right to me. Accuracy starting at 0.5, precision amazingly at one. I'm sure that'll go down very quickly. And everything else looks pretty okay to me. So that's gonna take a really, really long time to train on this CPU. In fact, it said 80 hours. Now it's down to 15 hours just for one epoch. We will now rerun this. So what you wanna do if you're on CoLab, and since we have, sorry, restart runtime, yes. Um, so what you wanna do is actually disconnect and delete runtime so you don't run into any file issues. Okay, my CoLab just crashed, but I did save everything. Make sure you press Control S or probably Command S often to make sure you're saving things. And what you wanna do is make sure that you have a fresh runtime. So do disconnect and delete runtime just so that your file system is fresh here. You need to get your Kaggle token back up. So I am going to upload mine back here. Okay, Kaggle.json. And then you should be able to just make sure you are on a GPU. I think that actually means I'll have to upload this again. Yep, I'm gonna upload that one more time. I will just do run all, and then that should take a few minutes because there's a lot of stuff it has to do. Okay, here on this GPU, I see about eight minutes per epoch. The accuracy is very quickly going up. Started at 50, it's up to 55, 56. Precision and recall are going up to one. If you don't know what these metrics are, by the way, I have a full video on that and I'll actually link that in the description of this video. Now, a couple things if you wanted to make this faster, I'll just show you some things that you could change. We are going to go into our model at the top, remove all of these weird other things that don't need to be there. And as I said, you could say, let some of this be trainable, but that would actually make it take longer. Uh, we actually don't need this conf layer. And so if you didn't want that, you could take that out. Sometimes that's used. I'm just gonna remove that. And you could make these smaller values as well, like 512 here, maybe 512 here. Now, if you were to run this again, like I did, you should see pretty much right away, really good metrics, all accuracy, precision, recall, AUC are close to one, which is what we want. This is for the training set. So I will let it run for one epoch just to make sure that it does well in the validation set as well. Sorry for the headache there. This switched to white because this is actually a different account. This one has Colab Pro Plus and I didn't want to wait for the other one to train. We do see Val Accuracy, Val Precision, Val Recall are basically perfect for the Val set. Uh, Val AUC, I think it seems to be messed up. Kind of confusing because AUC on the training set is working, but it's not working on the validation set. Maybe someone can correct me on why that's wrong. I don't know, uh, but clearly this model works very, very well. Okay, again, sorry for the switching of the colors. I just switched it back to the dark one. Okay, assuming you had a model that you did want to save, you would save it like this. I'm just gonna copy some things in here. To save your trained model, do mymodel.save, and this is the directory name, so you'd save it in the model directory. Assuming it was in the model directory, if you're on Colab, you might want to zip it to move it around. So to download your saved model, zip with the code below. So zip, exclamation zip, dash r, model.zip, and then model. So it'll make this model.zip from this model folder that you created above. There may be times when you want to unzip that folder. So if you were to load a model, you would want to unzip a zipped model folder and you do exclamation unzip model.zip and then to load a model back in memory. So to load a model back in memory from an unzipped model folder, this would have unzipped it. And so from an unzipped model folder, load it back in memory. You would do model or whatever variable you want is model, and then your unzipped model directory. Okay, but I'm just gonna stick with whatever one happened to train in this notebook. Now to use this model for prediction, it is a little bit non-trivial because the TensorFlow dataset thing did actually deal with the changing of the picture size. So here, if you had some random picture and you tried to use the model, well, you would need to do one of two things. You would need to load it back up into a TensorFlow dataset 
I don't really recommend that. So I'm gonna show you the other recommendation, which is just use Pillow to load images and resize them. So I'm going to magically have some cat picture that I want to show here. I'm gonna upload a cat picture. Okay, here you go. That cat dot a random cat I added dot JPEG is here again. It's a very big non-square resolution and we will see that from PIL, we'll import image and then we'll do image is image dot open and then the name of that file i'm just going to copy that in because it's kind of a kind of a funny name here so open that file there so i loaded up that image and then we'll do image is image dot resize into the shape the model wants which is 224 by 224 we'll give that tuple and if we just run image here you should see that cute little cat that i uploaded here Okay, so now that we have that cat, this is actually in pillow format. And so you can write image and it shows the image. We want it to be in a NumPy array. And that's really easy. You just do image is equal to np dot as, sorry, as array of the image. And then you should see image is a bunch of numbers because it's a NumPy array. If you do image dot shape, then now it shows 224 by 224 by three, which is what our model wants, perfect. Now I'm just gonna pretend that I have another image here by copying this same image and having it as another variable. You really don't wanna do this code, so I wouldn't bother writing this yourself. From copy, import, deep copy, and then we'll get image two is really the same as image one, deep copy of the image. And just to show that I have two images, I'll have images is image and then image two. What you would probably do is you would have a directory of all the images that you would want and in a for loop you would load up all of the images in this pillow format so you'd have a list of pillow images and then you would have this list of numpy array images if you were to call this numpy dot as array in a loop as well so now we have multiple images and just to show you how to get prediction i'll just call this thing prediction is equal to my model dot predict and it has to be a numpy array of these things. So numpy dot array of the images, that's automatically gonna deal with having a batch because we have multiple images here. So here you go, we have it in a batch of images. Prediction is greater than 0.5 to threshold it, and you should see that it thinks false. Okay, so both of these things are falses. If you actually don't include the 0.5, it'll show you the probabilities. Here, it is a very, very low probability for both, the same one because it's the same picture. And so there you go. This has very, very close to zero probability, meaning that the cat label is represented as zero, the dog label is represented as one. And so if it is very, very close to zero, that means the model thinks that this is a cat, which is good. Now this is a little bit different if you were doing multi-class classification. You would actually have each of the answers is a vector of probabilities. You would need to do a numpy.argmax across that right axis and make sure you look at the shape of it to make sure you got the right axis. And then you'd be left with an index corresponding to what the model predicts is the right index. However, what is an index? Well, I'm not gonna show you because I'm not doing multi-class classification. However, if you needed to get the index and map it to a particular class, what you would need to do is have your list of classes. And so say your list of classes was say cats and dogs. If you had multiple over here, then there would be more than two. And so you would put those in here. And if you do sorted on that list of classes, that is going to make sure it sorts it in the particular way that TensorFlow is going to use. And so this would be your zero class. This would be your one class. Hence for us, this probability of zero, this corresponds to cat because that's the zero class and dogs is the one class. That's why that worked out. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Have a great day, guys, and I'll see you later.